And I have an expert in here with me today. And she actually travels in an RV, which I think is absolutely fantastic. She lives in an RV. Terrific. Liz Wilcox, thank you so much for being here on the show. Hey, thanks for having me, Dustin. I am so excited. I First of all, I just love the name of this podcast, Successfully Unemployed. I just want to say um, my husband is nearing a type of graduation and he's talking about getting a job and things like that. And he asked me some advice about something and I said, I don't know. I haven't had a job in 10 years. Um, I, I have no advice for you. And he, <laughs> he just rolled his eyes like, Ugh, you're you're useless to me right now. So um, yes, successfully unemployed. I need to put that on my resume that I will never use. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I, I gave up all my resumes. There's no way I'll ever be employed again. I'm literally going to never be employed. So let's jump right into it, Liz. How do you make money to provide for yourself and your family be without having a job? You know, a J-O-B, a just over broke job. How do you do that? Just over broke. Dang, that, that hurts. <laughs> <laughs> Someone out there listening is like, ouch, <laughs> Dustin, why? You got to be like that. Take it there. Um, yeah, so I do a couple things. You mentioned I live in an RV. So for the last three years, I've been blogging, writing, um, being a sort of, I guess, um, RV influencer, you can say. And through that blog, it's called The Virtual Campground, and I create digital products for people um, to keep them happy and humored on the road. I share stories. I run a digital summit with some friends. We've done that three years in a row. That's a huge moneymaker for me, and it's so much fun. Uh, last year, we reached over 7,000 people. We hosted a live event, um, and then I have you know a course through that channel and things like that. Um, also, I am a launch strategist and copywriter, you know, taking all that information that I've gathered, all that experience from being in the RV space, I realized that I love selling. A lot of people shy away from it, you know, and I remember as a kid, like in college, I tried to sell Cutco, you know, the knives, Every, you know, you see the flyer, you go to the seminar. Um, I didn't make one sale. The guy told me that for the first time in his whole history, he actually had to pay someone like the minimum amount just for going out on calls because <laughs> I had it because I was so I had such the wrong mindset. But now after experience creating my own products, creating things that I believe in and that I know help serve my readers and my customers, like I just I just love sales and I love live launching. You know, I'm not like very evergreen. Like I love doing it, being there live, um, helping customers as they come into programs. So now I do launch strategy and um, email copywriting to turn followers into friends that buy for other people. That's great. And for everybody on the podcast, you're not able to see this. So go to YouTube and watch the video. You're going to see Liz. She's actually in her RV because she travels in RV. She goes all over the country and she that's where she lives, which I think is absolute. I, my wife would love that, number one. I think it would be fantastic, <laughs> number two. But also she's wearing... I'm wearing a Captain America shirt right now. She is wearing a Britney shirt right now. So I just Britney thought that Spears. Was, yes, yes, exactly. I yeah, I'm channeling my inner Brittany today because I want to get in the zone for you. I want to teach you how to be successfully unemployed. That's awesome. Okay. Just like me and Brittany <laughs> and Justin. <laughs> yes, exactly. And so you are, I, you and I are, we're ordinary people. We were just, we're, we're, sorry, we're not ordinary. We're normal people. Ordinary people have jobs. That's what ordinary people do. We go to school. We're taught to slave our lives away and hopefully work for a company that would take care of us until we're 60 years old and retire. Well, we gave that up and you did a long time ago, which is amazing. Absolutely fantastic. So when you had a job, tell it to us really briefly about that process of going from the job, what were you doing? And then what you like the thought process and then eventually getting to where you actually quit. Like, how did that feel? Right. So actually, I have a pretty unique story. Like Dustin said, I've been an entrepreneur or a freelancer um, for basically my whole life. At the time of this interview, I am almost 32 and I haven't had a real job, quote unquote, where I clocked in 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 about a decade. And so the last job I had, I was in college and I actually worked at a gas station 
Um, <laughs> shout out to Dodges. And I basically hustled fried chicken gasoline and cash in people's checks that didn't have bank accounts. <laughs> okay, so that's what I did. And I was in college um, to be an educator. I wanted to be an elementary school teacher. I even went on to get my master's degree um, in educational leadership. I wanted to be a principal. I wanted to, you know, kind of be, I guess, like an education renegade and like turn everybody on their heels, say, no, actually, we can do it this way. And you know, start a revolution there, I guess. <laughs> um, but I, so back to working at the Dodge store, working at a gas station, you know, I knew I didn't want to do that the rest of my life. And so I was like, how can I make more money and make more impact? So that's when the idea to become a principal and start this revolution <laughs> sort of came to mind. And um, was when I was in my master's, Oh, well, Dodges fired me because they lost. So this is this is what changed my mind. And this is really what made me decide to become unemployed, so to speak. So I had worked there three years, super loyal. Just I'm sure you can relate to this. You know, you're in a job. You're super loyal. You're eager. You're ready to learn. You know, <laughs> you're slinging the chicken. You're cashing the checks. <laughs> you know, you're turning on the pumps or, you know, obviously, I'm sure if you're listening to this, you probably have more of a desk job. But um, yeah, you know, I was working my butt off and they fired me. My drawer was short $100. And they, the manager said they looked for weeks at all the cameras. Obviously, it's a gas station. They have a ton of cameras, right? And they could not find the mistake. They could not see me taking anything. Obviously, I didn't take anything. I was 20-something. I loved my job. I thought it was fun. I was in college, you know. And they fired me. And I sat in the gas station at the pump. <laughs> I turned on Justin Timberlake. <laughs> And I just cried and cried for hours in the parking lot because I had just dedicated three years of my 20 year life, basically, you know, that's a lot of time um, to this gas station and for them to just dismiss me like that with no proof, even saying like, hey, we're sorry, we have to fire you was just absolutely devastating. So picture poor little Liz Wilcox <laughs> um, crying in her car, <laughs> listening to JT and um you know, a few weeks went by. I was trying to think of where I could get a job, something that would accommodate my school schedule. And for some reason, I guess this was back when Craigslist was super popular. I decided to go on Craigslist and I found someone was looking for a type of like tutor for their son. And, you know, I, I emailed this person back. We ended up meeting at a Taco Bell, <laughs> like, Late at night after his shift, he was a doctor. I was in school. So we just ended up meeting. I got the job. I worked for this person for three years on top of doing different freelance types of things, delivering food for, um, you know, chains of restaurants, um, cleaning people's houses, whatever I could find on Craigslist gigs, um, which is still a thing, believe it or not, <laughs> 10 years later. And I realized in that moment, I was in charge of my life. I didn't have to work, you know, slinging chicken, cashing checks, getting yelled at constantly by people coming in. Because this was also when gas prices were near $5, you know, a gallon. So I was constantly getting yelled at about that. Like, you know, I have any pull in that situation. Um, but I realized I could work the hours I wanted to work. People valued me. If I was coming into their house to clean, they were freaking stoked about it. You know, if I was tutoring that boy, um, that guy ended up paying me like $60, $80 an hour. Over the summer, I made so much money. I ended up turning that into, a, it was still part-time, but it was 10 hours a week. He gave me a type of salary. Um, I told him I had to do some other job and he said, no, I want you exclusively to work for me because he was a single dad. He was a doctor. He had two kids. And um, anytime my car would break down, he would fix it, all types of things. And so that's when my mindset really started to shift. Even though I was still in college, still in my master's degree, et cetera, I realized I could be in charge of my own money making and I could do it in a way that I held all the cards, 
right? Like people valued me and having that job and those little freelance gigs, man, it just really showed me that the money is out there if you, you know, go for it and you ask for it and you find those people that you can serve and that really, really need and want you. And so that's my story. It's a little unique um, in that, you know, I never actually went to the nine to five. I kind of figured it out a little beforehand. Um, but I hope it inspires you to see that, you know, even some 20 year old not graduated college yet um, has value. And so do you. I love that idea that everybody has value. In fact, the reason why I know that and you should know that is if somebody's going to employ you, they're going to pay you money to make them money. So there's value inherently inside of you. And on top of that, you're making more money for that other person. So why not do it for yourself? Now, I also went through a story of, I didn't actually get fired. I got laid off. You know, I went that the whole, but what's sad is it takes, almost takes something like that to you to wake up and realize if I keep working for somebody else, eventually the rug's going to be pulled out or the ladder's going to be pulled out from underneath me. And I'm going to be stuck without anything. So right now, if you can get started, literally wherever you are right now, get started now in something that's going to make yourself financially independent where you're not relying on somebody else. That's going to be so much better. So now how with you have your RV website, you're also going to um, you're teaching people how to how to um, uh, craft their copy, how to launch products. Now, what else with the R, the, the RV um, website that you like, is it through affiliate sales? Is it through, um, uh, ads? How do you make money through the RV site? Yeah, sure. So with the virtual campground, um, so I started it as a business. I didn't know anything about making money online. I just knew I wanted to travel the country in an RV and my husband was in the army at the time. So while he was in the army, I needed to come up with a way to make that cash flow so we could go, you know, do the bucket list, live hashtag RV life, right? Um, so I saw, you know, I started Googling and, you know, I saw all these bloggers and in my mind, I thought they were all, you know, making all types of money. And so I knew, I, you know, I saw a young couple out there living the dream, so to speak, you know, on their website, it said featured on Fox News, CNN, all this. And I was like, oh, well, if they can do it, I can do that. I'm at least two years older than them. Like, well, I could do that. Oh, silly, naive Liz. Um, <laughs> so I started my website. I started it as a business. I knew I wanted it to make money. And so, again, that different mindset, I think really helped me to actually make money from it. So within the first six months, I had compiled a book with some other bloggers, sold it. I gave them 50% commissions. Um, That book actually caused, um, how can I say this? Um, It grabbed the attention of a sponsor and they actually paid me for copies of the book to get leads. I didn't know that was a thing. This was all less than a year of blogging. And then I got with some people that had helped me write that book. And we created this digital summit that I was talking about earlier. And we just went live. This was before digital summits were even a thing. If you don't know what they are, it's basically like a conference, but just online, a bunch of Zoom calls or that type of thing. And it's like an event that runs online. Um, so I said, oh, we could do that. And this was, you know, a few years ago before that was really even big. And we just went live and, um, you know, that turned into after three years has turned into a big money maker where we sell the videos, we sell sponsorship ads. Um, and then I, I'm trying to think. Oh, I have a course. So I have an RV maintenance course. My husband is actually a certified RV tech. So after a couple of years, I finally convinced him, please create this course with me. Um, You know, I have the sales experience. I have the audience. You know, I've spent years building it. I have this relationship with my audience. Like, let's build a course. I know they need this and I know that they will buy it. And so we launched the course about a year ago. And since then, we've have over 300 students. It's an ongoing thing. Um, I have several affiliates that they get, you know, half of the 
sale, I get the other half, that type of thing. So all of those things are making money continuously um, set up through, you know, automations or launches or, you know, just the traffic coming in. That's a lot of ways to make money. I love that idea. And especially leveraging something that your husband already knows. He already, you know that people want it. On top of that, you um, have the audience. That's just just like a recipe for, for great success. So good for you. Right. Thanks. So I want to I want to point out kind of the underlying theme of all these products is partnership. You do not have to do this alone. And so the way that I feel I've accelerated my success is I don't do anything alone. That's not my strength. My strength is building that audience, get standing out above the crowd, um, building true relationships with my subscribers. My weakness is you know, putting all the pieces together and actually hitting every benchmark, if that makes sense. But if I have accountability, I'll do it like that. You know, I will never miss a deadline. You know, I will never miss that launch. Things are happening. You know, I'm setting it in motion if I have accountability. And so I've managed to somehow (laughs) convince people to create products with me. I've created three alone and four with other people. Um, So, you know, that summit I talk about, I do that with three other people. We work really well as a team now. And, you know, so I only get a quarter of the profits, but it can be so much bigger and it grabs that visibility so that I have a bigger audience for when I launch my course, which is just my own thing, if that makes sense. The first book I created, um, you know, some people call me an author, but I just compiled that. Um, you know, I said, hey, you give me a chapter, you give me a chapter. And it's just a collection of stories. It's just a funny book. Um, and so if you're thinking, you know, I'm not ready yet to quit my job or, you know, how do you really get to the next level? It's all about networking, positioning yourself for partnerships and being open to those relationships. Dustin mentioned affiliates. That's a great way. But if you can create a product with a person, imagine how much bigger your audience can be and will be. That's a great point. I love all those things. Now, we have already looked at now, you have a product. You have created products. You're working with other people. I love that idea. Networking is one of the best ways to grow your business. And you don't have to do it alone. I love how you just hit the nail on the head. But now, if we were going to launch a product, and I know at LizWilcox.com, you actually show and teach that. How do we start? Like, where do we start with launching a product? What should we do to start everything? Well, I would not say start with creating the product. (laughs) A lot of people spend months, you know, sometimes years thinking about the perfect product and things like that. And honestly, um, I usually just follow the Jeff Walker product launch formula. It's super simple. You can check out his book. I'm sure Dustin can link it in the show notes for you. Um, But basically what you need to know is, To launch a product, you have to pre-launch it, if that makes sense. You have to talk about it. You have to share with your audience what it is you're doing. So let's take, let's just talk about my course because that's the biggest one I do by myself. So when I first launched the course, it was, we launched it in March, 2018. So in December, 2017, I sent out an email to my list, you know, this audience I had already built. And I said, hey, I'm thinking about creating this course. Click this link if you think that's a good idea. And 131 people clicked the link. I said, hey, that's pretty good. If I made 10% of those sales, you know, it's worth it. Um, So from January to March, I just kept talking about it. I I do a live short show with my RV blog and, um, you know, I kept talking about it there. I kept taking questions about RV maintenance, which was the topic. I kept writing newsletters about this RV maintenance topic, et cetera, et cetera, until I got to the open cart. So the way that I think of everything is how can I get my subscriber, like literally, you can't see me right now, but like if my finger, I want their finger on the mouse 
to click to buy. They're so eager. The second they open my email, I want them to click. And so when you're creating a product, whether it's, you know, online or it's a service or, you know, you have this brick and mortar that you dream about, how can you get people in your doors the second you open? Or how can you get people to click that button the second you open, um, you open that cart? And so that's how I do it. I just reverse engineer it. And I will say there is a caveat to that. You have to have a relationship with your subscribers, with your potential customers already. And so that's what I really, really teach with the email copywriting and launch strategy is how to turn that follower. So you get an Instagram follower, you get a new email subscriber, how to then turn them into a fan, someone that thinks you're like super cool, like, you know, they have fun reading your emails or checking out your content into a friend, someone who you know, you truly have that relationship with that they really know you and you've extended that um, arm of friendship. And once they're your friend, they're going to be the one that clicks the second you open their cart. So to take them on that journey from follower to fan to friend that buys, and I really highly suggest you do that through your email newsletter. So I, I, I think that's fantastic because once they're ready, they are well. You get them ready, and once it's ready, they are they are able to buy. Now, a lot of people we we've already heard of a funnel. Like we try to funnel people into it, into buying. And so there's there's many different ways to do it. But obviously, email is one of the best ways to do it. And in the the content and the copy that you're actually writing and sending out to them, you get them into the funnel. Hopefully, they buy. You know, get a little buy here, a little buy there, and eventually a big buy. But how do you get them to become? A friend like that. That's something that they I don't really hear anybody ever talking about. How do you get them to where they think, hey, you know what, Dustin actually cares about me. You know, he's like the guy next door that he wants to help me out. Of course, I want to buy. How do we do that? Answer your dang email. Uh, reply to comments. You know, I know social media can feel like a beast, right? But pick, just pick one platform. You know, you don't have to be on every single one and reply to people. You know, it's the same sales strategies and networking that worked 200 years ago works today. Just, you know, open yourself up and help your people, truly serve your people. There's no such thing in my mind as this evergreen funnel that you can literally set it and forget it. You know, if you are not nurturing those folks, those people coming into your um, I guess like sphere, your influencer sphere, whatever, you know, they're not going to go through the funnel and, f you know, click to buy and be excited. Um, you know, be authentic, be genuine. And part of that is actually responding to emails, actually responding to comments, um, being active in your network. So, um, with the copywriting, thing. I was just talking to someone. They Facebook messaged me a couple hours ago and they said, Hey, you know, I see you're in this Facebook group that I'm in. That's awesome. I also see you live in Tampa, Florida. My sister lives there. And we started talking and, you know, within minutes, or I'm sorry, within probably about an hour, she said, Hey, you know, maybe we can work together on X, Y, Z. And so boom, like we're pretty much friends now. Like we went through that pretty quickly. Um, but if I'm not open to receiving those types of messages, you know, that that's going to be cut off. And so I say, if you're at the beginning stage and you're just building something online, you have the advantage. You have the time to put in to those relationships. I'm not talking about, you know, we're not at the stage where we're scaling it and we're, you know, some Steve Larson or something, and we don't literally don't have the time yet. Um, when you're just building, you do have the time. So in your welcome sequence and your emails, first of all, get an opt-in if you don't have one, and then get a welcome sequence. And these are my jams. Like, and this is your way of turning that person into a friend within, you know, a week, we'll say. And that's it's all about getting to know them, asking them questions in the email. And when they reply to you, you reply back. And it doesn't, 
this can be very simple. Like with the RV blog, we'll say, I ask people, do you own an RV or not? And they can literally reply yes or no. It's a very simple question, but it opens up the bridge between you and them so that you can really get conversations going. Um, so that is that is just the way. Just start talking to people and be authentic. For me, <laughs> um, I love Mountain Dew. <laughs> so I talk about that and I, you know, I kind of poke fun at it because I'm like, I am not a 12 year old boy that does motocross. Like I'm not their ideal customer, but somehow I still love Mountain Dew. And something about that little joke about myself um, just lets people in. And so think about something about yourself that kind of stands out, but is really authentic and just go from there in your social media, in your newsletters, in your videos, wherever you are showing up online. You said so much in there that it, like everybody <laughs> should go back and no, I'm not saying that in a negative way. Everybody should go back and listen to it because as you're talking, my brain is firing off uh, either questions or like, yes, absolutely. And so okay. definitely you, everybody needs to go back and listen to it because there's so many great things inside there. Uh, one thing, that I find that is probably one of my, a big pet peeve of mine is when I email somebody and they have their assistant email me back. I'm like, oh my goodness, that's just, oh, oh, you might be this big hotshot, but I'm one person. And it seems like to me that I, at least this is how for me, I don't want to have an assistant that would actually reply, like reply to emails just because it only takes me like two minutes to reply to an email. Now that I'm not big enough to where I have like literally hundreds of thousands of emails, maybe might get there and might need that. But for me, I don't like that. But what are your thoughts about having an assistant that answers your emails and say, hey, this is me. I'm I'm Betty and, and Dustin's assistant. And he says this, like, what are your thoughts? Oh my gosh, Dustin, I think this is the perfect question. I'm blushing because I actually have done that. Like email is my life. I love email and I've actually worked for someone um, as their customer service support and then later as um, their personal assistant while their actual assistant was out on maternity leave. And so I did answer, oh my gosh, and within years, you know, thousands and thousands and thousands of emails. Um, not as this person, obviously, um, you know, you never want to do that. You never want to trick someone in that way. Um, but so I think I have a unique perspective. And I think there are times when you do get so big, it does not behoove you to answer every single email, like especially customer support. Like I can't log in. I can't do that. So those types of things, of course, you can get a customer support assistant. You can get your executive assistant, whoever to say like, hey, this is where you log in because you as you do build digital products and things like that, there are going to be those technical support questions. And so, yes, definitely get someone to help you. I'm all about outsourcing that type of thing. But if someone asks you a personal question, say you have a podcast called the Successfully Unemployed Podcast, and someone bears their heart to you and says, oh, you know, I've just, I just can't get over this roadblock, you know, and they write you, whether it's one paragraph or 10, but, you know, if somebody pours your pours their heart out, yes, definitely reply. And honestly, if you do, that person is going to be, first of all, so shocked that they, because like you said, Dustin, like, and then I get a reply from their assistant and I just roll my eyes, right? So the fact that you replied personally, you know, you said a couple things, you know, whether it's advice or you just say, hey, I, I feel for that situation, whatever the case may be. Um, I think that is really, really where it's at. And like Dustin pointed out, like it's, it, it's the difference between an eye roll and like this person is 100% committed to you and trusts you, you know, so much now. And that's actually a good way of networking is getting on people's lists that you um, admire, you aspire to be like, et cetera, and just hitting that reply button. And it might be really nerve wracking. Oh my gosh, am I going to get their assistant? Are they ever going to read this? Whatever. It doesn't matter. It's just an email. Just hit reply and, you know, just put a couple of words out there. Um, you know, I liked this about your latest blog post. I love this podcast episode with Liz Wilcox. It was the best one. You should have her on again. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, 
Yeah. And that, you know, might open up another conversation to help network, but that's another conversation. <laughs> yeah. And um, so I, I've got a uh, lot to share, Dustin. <laughs> I'm glad you do. That's why we have this show because we were trying to learn. I, I learn from every single person that comes on this show because I absolutely don't know everything. In fact, I know very little. And so I just try to learn as much as I can. So once we are thinking about, or, you know, we've already got a product, we've already launched it. What are your thoughts about keeping a open cart or opening and closing carts? And what, are you, how should we make sure we get the most people in there to help them the most? Oh, this is such a, this is the great debate of all time, right? So open cart would mean you can have this evergreen funnel. You can create these email sequences, um, that type of thing that, uh, set it and forget it type of situation, right? Or set it and maintain, we'll say. Because <laughs> you definitely never want to forget about something that you're selling, especially constantly. Um, versus the um, creating scarcity, you know, you must close it because people need a reason to buy type of thing. And I recently just had a client who's, you know, new to selling products. Um, and she said, you know, I just hate when people say you've got to close the cart. I just, you know, why? I don't actually have to. And it just feels gross. Um, but I would say there are some benefits other than, you know, getting people to buy, forcing people to buy, so to speak, to your sanity for closing the cart. Um, if you have something open all the time, you're constantly thinking about it. You're constantly thinking about, you know, how can I get more customers? It What's the conversion rate? Let's check those Facebook ads again, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, where when you close the cart, you can really serve your students, serve your customers, whatever it is. And so that's the way that I prefer to look at it. Um, and I always like to close cart because, I mean, of course, yes, it creates scarcity. Um, you know, some people just aren't going to buy without that final push. And that's totally fine um, because you should close the cart because it just gives you peace of mind. Like you can, you know, when you launch something, your stress level can get up to your ears, you know, like, oh my gosh, how many sales, all these questions. And when you close it, you can wash your hands of it and just serve the students. You don't have to worry about sales anymore. You can just worry about those students, those customers that have come in and just really give them everything you've promised them. Because I know your sales page was rocking it and you have bonuses and, <laughs> you know, you you know, you created something that you love and that they're going to love, but they need the creator. They need you, Dustin, to be in it with them. They're going to have the, you're going to have a ton of emails. You're going to have those people that bear their heart out to you and, you know, novel like emails about why they bought this course and what they need from it and how you can help them. And you need to serve those students. And I think that's why you should keep cart close, like open and close your cart because you want to serve the people that have trusted you enough to give you money to help them with their life. That's great. I'm glad you, I'm glad you said that because there, there are so many different people talking about, you know, the benefits of others, um, one versus the other. Now, if we are going to then start scaling our business and we want to get more people into our products, whatever we're trying to sell, how do we look to scale it so that we can say, you know what? I have money coming in. Let me go ahead and quit my job and be successful and employed. How do we scale the business? Well, you can get, you know, the first thing that comes to mind is, of course, affiliates, right? So when you're doing a launch, you know, my first launch with um, the RV maintenance course I was doing, that, <laughs> so let me backtrack and just tell you guys, I was editing videos and everything, creating the course while I was tent camping, speaking and sponsoring an RV related event. And so I just, I'm just taking a break to tell you that um, because if I can do that, if I can launch a course under those circumstances and do as well as I did, whatever your idea is and whatever your circumstances are, oh my gosh, you're going to blow it out of the water, baby. <laughs> like, <laughs> And I mean that because 
I don't know what I was thinking. I was literally in a tent. It was 20 degrees. I was freezing. Um, oh, and I had my four-year-old with me. Um, I have a kid. So, so we were tent camping in winter and I was staying up all night getting this course done. So anyway, I just say that to say, you know, whatever your idea is, however you're going to launch it, you can do it, baby. So how do we scale? The first thing, affiliates. So the first time I launched that course, I only had one affiliate. My big dream was to have, you know, like five heavy hitters, so to speak, and they were going to sell. They were going to match my sales and I was going to double my income. But then I was in a tent with my four-year-old and freezing. And I said, you know what? I'm not going to reach out to those folks just yet. (laughs) And so when you're ready to scale, you know, you can... If you've been doing it right and building that network and, you know, hitting reply to your, you know, online heroes, so to speak, you can start reaching out and, you know, getting, showing them, hey, I've done this with my course. I've done this with my book, et cetera. I'd love for you to be a part of it. And so that's a great way to scale. This winter, I had a ton of affiliates selling the course, um, during their like, you know, 12 days of Christmas deals, Black Friday, I didn't have to sell anything because I was working on my summit with my friends. And so I didn't really have time for the Black Friday, whatever, whatever. But it was great because I still had income coming in, cart open and close, but I wasn't doing anything. Um, So I would say that's a great way to start scaling Next, of course, is Facebook ads, things like that. I actually don't have too much experience. Um, everything I've ever done has been completely organic. Um, if you can't tell, I'm all about building relationships and actually like getting your hands dirty with your people, I guess <laughs> you can say. Um, so, but I know I have friends that have had great success with Facebook ads, Instagram ads, um, getting on those social media networks and just really hammering it out. I'm trying to think. I'm sure sh- I'm sure there's another way to scale. Evergreen funnels, of course, you know, you can check out click funnels, that type of thing, Kajabi, and just really get things evergreen and, you know, pump that Facebook ad up and just, you know, just build, build, build. Um, but I really prefer, you know, keeping it I prefer the affiliate route and just building those relationships. That way I know I'm not um, at the mercy of my Facebook ads. Um, I'm at the mercy of these people I've built relationships with and that have the same customer base as me. That's great. Um, I I haven't actually done, I have some affiliates, people for my courses where I, I teach people how to invest in rental properties, how to buy properties, build a business and be successful and quit their job just like I did. And so I just created a step-by-step process and I documented it and Put it cool. out there. And so people love it. I actually have students that are quitting their jobs. I had one student quit their job in three months or three years. So quit their job because they had enough passive income. They don't work. But as oh yeah, baby. Yes. That's exactly. awesome. Great job, Dustin. And congrats to whoever that is. Awesome. Yeah. And with that, I thought, you know what? I can help more people by doing Facebook ads. Now I'm not gonna say this to like nobody don't I'm not like saying don't do Facebook ads, but I've literally spent twenty five thousand dollars and maybe got three or four thousand dollars out of it. Now my yeah, I, hair just grew five inches, guys. You can't see it, but <laughs> pointing. I, and I even paid somebody who's fantastic. I'm not gonna say who it is, but I he's got other people that has not necessarily real estate, but he's to, um you know teach or uh sells their does Facebook ads for their courses and they're killing it. But for me he literally could not get it, it was it was really bad. I got a lot of people coming in, but nobody's buying. So all that to say I spent a lot of money and for me and one I want to add is if Google sends you traffic, it is really great traffic because Google knows, hey, somebody's searching for rental properties. Dustin has something that people like. Let me keep sending them or whatever it is, if it might be RV. And so what I really like is it when I have Google send me uh, people to me because of the articles that I write, because uh, when somebody finds my articles, they stay on it and all that sort of stuff. If I make a site that Google loves and uh, videos that YouTube loves, they're going to send people to me. And that's a great funnel. And you do the work one time and it's there over and over again. You don't have to keep paying for it. It's, it's right there. So that's another thing I would add. What are your thoughts? I love that you brought up, you know, SEO and really building that traffic. Of course, you know, you can always get better traffic. You can always, you know, modify your content for Google and, um, 
that's one thing, you know, now that I've, you know, I've done all that I can do basically with um, TVC, my RV blog, that is the last thing that I am working on to scale it, right? You know, I even have ads on my site. And so my Pinterest manager is constantly telling me, you know, your SEO has got to get better too, because, you know, now your ads can start working better. And so, yeah, now it's more about going into all this content. You know, I have hundreds of blog posts and just modifying it for SEO um, so that I can get more people to my opt-in. I can get more people on my email list. All of this stuff is sort of automated. I talk about, you know, hitting reply and say, you know, and getting my subscribers to reply to me. I even now, after three years, have, you know, canned replies for when they do reply. If they say they have an RV, you know, I have something that automatically sends back, hey, that's awesome. I can't wait to get to know you better. And it's just as simple as that. You know, it doesn't have, you don't have, if they write 10 paragraphs, you don't have to write 10 paragraphs back. You just have to write back. You just have to show that you're a real person that wants a real connection. And so, yeah, I've got all of that. So now that I, now all that's in place. So I'm working on building that traffic to get more people and scaling that way as well. So that's great. Great yeah. point. If, if, Two ordinary people like us. I, we're, we're just normal people. Like your, your person next door living in an RV or living in a house next door. Yeah. Like we're just wearing like Britney Spears t-shirts. I'm wearing a Captain America t-shirt. If we're just normal people that can do this, you absolutely can. So Liz, you've given us so much great content. Now I want to jump into the rapid fire round. Are you ready for that? Oh my gosh. I was born for this, baby. <laughs> Let's do it. Yes. I love it. You guys, I love I'll your energy. Your yes. Oh, thanks. <laughs> so with not having a job, working 40 plus, 50 plus hours a week, we have a little bit of extra time to give back and hopefully make the world a better place or even just our community or neighborhood or family a better place. How are you giving back? Um, well, with my RV website, this is a really super easy one. Um, all, any and all sales that I make, I donate 10% um, to the National Parks Foundation, which is something I care about and my subscribers care about a lot. Um, yeah. Yeah. That's great. Now, do you actually tell them that in, in the sales copy? I, I actually used to, um, but I don't anymore because I just found, you know, it's just something that I like to do. I don't want to use it as a sales yeah. strategy. Um, the giving is the reward, not the, right, hey, I got a right. sale and go, yeah, yeah, I get that. Okay, cool. Right. So next question, if somebody were to get started in doing anything, if you give us a lot of great content, maybe give us a succinct one or one minute of, if I'm going to get started uh, either in RVing or selling a product, what would your suggestion be? You mean online? Yes. Okay. So first of all, the first thing you want to do is open up a convert kit account, pay the $29 a month. It's worth it. Um, you know, MailChimp, no, you need, you need ConvertKit. So open up a ConvertKit account and go to the landing pages. They've got lots and lots of options to choose from nowadays and start your email list and just create an opt-in or, you know, a landing page that says, Hey, um, Dustin.com is coming. I'm going to talk about XYZ. I know you want it. Um, sign up for my email newsletter. And I'm going to post that on my social media, Facebook, Instagram. I'm going to send it to um, anyone that I have emails for that I think would be interested. And I'm just going to immediately start getting people on my email list. And from there, I'm going to send them an email. Hey, thanks so much. This is brand new. I'm super excited to share it with you. Um, it really means a lot to me that, you know, you're, you gave me your email and you're taking a chance on this newbie. And then from there, I'm just going to keep emailing them. I'll slowly work on my website. I'll slowly work on my social media, but I'm going to start emailing these people right away, sharing the process. Like I was talking about with the pre-launch, you want to share the process. Do This is a this is your pre-launch baby of any and all products you're going to create. And so just share with them, hey, I'm working on X today. I was thinking about you. I can't wait to one day offer a product about why you know, et cetera. And just that's how I would start. That's fantastic. I love it. Now, if you were to go back and give your 13 year old self any pit t uh, tip or a piece of advice that would help you to get to where you are today, what would it be? Uh, 
start a blog and don't go to college. <laughs> <laughs> so I absolutely love both of those, but I want to quickly dive into why not college? Uh, I just feel like it was a waste of time for me. And it was a mu- I went to college because my mom said I was too smart not to. I wanted to be a stand up comedian. I wanted to be on Saturday Night Live. And I told my mom that. And she said, Are you crazy? You're the smartest person in this family. And you're going to college. I was also the first person to graduate from college in my family for like generations. So I felt a lot of pressure that I had to go to college. I had to pick a job. And I also grew up very poor. So being a teacher to me was like, wow, so much money. And so my 13-year-old self, if she knew there was a thing called the internet and you could make money from it, oh, man. No offense, Dustin, but I would not be talking to you today. (laughs) (laughs) Well... You see, for everybody watching on YouTube, see these kids right there? Those are my four kids. Actually, they're older now, but those are little when they were younger. Uh, but I have yeah. four kids, and I am literally teaching them how, and I'm telling them, and we, well, we homeschool. I wouldn't say we, my wife homeschools all of our four kids. I have the easy job of making money. She has a they hard are job. They're homeschooled. Of, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So she has a hard job of teaching them. But on top of that, why would I have them go into fifty or $60,000 worth of debt or more? In getting a piece of paper and hopefully getting a job afterwards, and you're hoping you don't get fired just or laid off like us, why not take that fifty or sixty thousand dollars, do something with it, start a business or buy a rental property? Like I love rental property, so I'm going to show them. Hey, here's fifty thousand dollars. Let's go buy a rental property, take that money, do it all over again, and then eventually, in ten years, you're not going to even need to work. So why would you go to college to eventually get fired? So let's go ahead and let's bypass all that so you can be successfully unemployed. What are your thoughts? Love it. Awesome. I'm on board. I'm on Perfect. board, Daddy Dustin. <laughs> <laughs> Last or two more questions, two more really quick questions. What is one app? It could be a tool or it could be a journal or something that you would suggest for us to implement into our lives. Stop using apps. Get off your phone. I I have if you're watching on YouTube, but if you're listening, you can, I'm pulling up my phone and I really only have five apps on my home screen. I guess Voxer, if you don't know about Voxer, it's like a walkie talkie. And I use that with my clients um, to follow up instead of email because my inbox can get quite crowded because I'm constantly asking people to reply. And so Voxer is a direct connection. It's like a walkie talkie. Remember those old Nokia phones? Um, It's just like that. And you can talk directly to your clients Um, whoever, your friends. And it's just a great way um, to bypass getting on social media, using all those different apps, and just literally talking directly to someone. So I guess that's the only app I'm really using right now. I don't even have the Facebook app. Wow. So two things, get rid of uh, the apps, shrink it down, which I agree. I mean, I spend probably too much time on just random apps. I don't need to, but Vox. Okay, cool. Now, the last question is, what is one nonfiction book? It could be business related or anything like how to RV better um, that you would suggest we should read. Oh, I love Real Artists Don't Starve by Jeff Goins. It's a great book. It's not just a great title. It's a great book. And it's all about thriving as a creative in this digital age. And it's where I learned a lot of this stuff. It's where I really learned like turn your follower into a friend people buy from friends type of thing. And Jeff is just really, he's only 36. He's been successfully unemployed, I guess, um, probably for six or seven years. And this is his third book, I think. Um, It's a best-selling book. It's just really good to teach you about, you know, how to actually make money from your craft, whether you, you know, are doing client-based work like me or, you know, doing the RV thing and you want to create a digital product, or you're an actual artist, like creating art on a canvas, how to make money from that online. He teaches, I think, five or six strategies. I've read it a few times. I've probably given away 20 copies in the last couple years. It's just a really good book. It's super easy to read. It's like, took me like two days, I guess. And um, Jeff just has a really great way of, he's a really good like wordsmith. And so I think you'll enjoy it. That's great. Nobody's given that recommendation. So I love that we have a brand new book that we get to read. Sweet. Pick Liz, it up. 
Liz, you are fantastic. I'm so excited we got to meet and we have you on the show. How can people reach out to you? How can they find you and get to know more about you? Well, the best way is through email. So you can go to LizWilcox.com. And right now I'm actually just building that site. So if you're listening, it might not be up yet. But if you're listening in like 2021, it's there. Check it out. LizWilcox.com. You can sign up for my email newsletter and hit you. If you hit reply, you know dang well I'm going to answer. At a girl. Awesome. Well, Liz, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate all the wisdom and the, the I just thoroughly enjoyed it. So thank you very much. <laughs> I did too. Thanks so much, Dustin. Thanks right, for Liz. listening. Take care. That is it for today's show. Now, I would so appreciate it if you hit that like and that subscribe button. I want you to be a part of this. So subscribe so I can get you all this great content on how to be successfully unemployed. Now, I do want this show to be all about you. So in the comments, I would love to hear your comments of how this is a great way and how you're going to apply this to quit your job. Or this is the horrible, the worst way to be successfully unemployed, whatever it might be. Leave it in the comments below so that I can interact with you. I want to see how I can help you to quit your J-O-B that just over broke job. So if you got anything out of this, I would love it if you shared with one person said, hey, there is a way to be successfully unemployed and quit that just over broke job. And here's the way to do it. So share it with one person. So you guys are fantastic. Thank you so much for being here with me on the Successfully Unemployed show. We'll see you next time.